What if I told you that sushi didn't have to include seafood or even rice and can smell as stinky as blue cheese? There's an old Japanese story that compares the taste of sushi to something you don't expect. A man is visiting his friend's house when he sees a merchant. It seems like a slow sales day for her, likely due to her being passed out on the ground. The smell of alcohol from her breath is doing its best to keep the shop running, but is not having much luck. Next to her is a bucket of whatever she's selling. The man doesn't bother to check and goes inside. After visiting his friend, the man comes out and sees the merchant still there, but awake this time. Good news is that the bucket is open and he now sees what she's selling. Sweetfish sushi. Bad news is that she's currently seasoning it with her vomit. Well, that's a shame, he says. There goes a fine bucket of sushi. Oh my Buddha. Instead of throwing away the vomit bucket, the merchant reaches in and mixes it so that the man can no longer see what is vomit and what is sushi. The man runs away, disgusted and feeling sorry for her customers. They surely wouldn't even notice the new flavor because sushi looks and smells so much like vomit. He vows never to eat sweetfish sushi again. Thank you, Japanese man, for showing us the dangers of using the wrong seasoning. But why did the man think that sushi tasted so much like vomit that people wouldn't be able to tell the difference? It's actually not far-fetched. You see, back in ancient Japan, sushi did not mean fresh fish. It meant the opposite. Sushi was fermented, left to sit preserved for years. The gorgeous fresh fish type of sushi came later, around the time people needed content for their Instagram. The rice used for fermentation was not meant to be eaten but tossed away because it ended up looking like porridge and smelling like shu. The lactic acid made during the process tasted sour like stomach acid. Put those things together, imitation vomit. So where did the first sushi come from? That's a hard question. The problem with foods is that they don't usually survive in the ground for centuries the way religious tablets do. This pisses off food historians to no end, but then they remember they get to study food for a living and they stop feeling so bad. Then they go outside to research a slice of pizza. Unable to dig up ancient foods most of the time, food historians settle for looking at writings, like cookbooks, where they run into another problem. Cookbooks in the old days were often not meant to be used for making food. They were meant to be read for fun, like a fiction book. That's it for tonight, son. But daddy, I want to know what happens next in cooking with Harry Potter magical meals for muggles. Many dishes were impossible to cook. Cookbook recipes were like friends of rich people. It was hard to tell the real ones from the fake. Plus, most cookbooks described dishes for special occasions. Normal everyday foods rarely soiled their pages. The oldest writings about sushi actually came from a panda sanctuary called China. From a Chinese dictionary in the 200s BCE came the word zhi, which meant fish preserved in salt and fermented. Another Chinese dictionary from the 200 CE had the word jia, which meant fish preserved in salt and fermented with rice. The main difference was the rice. Eventually, the first word came to mean the same as the second, fish preserved with salt and rice. A few centuries later, when these words immigrated to Japan, the Japanese pronounced both as sushi or sushi. In Japanese, it was written like this or this, giving us many ways to write sushi. From this evidence, you would think that the first sushi dish was made in China as fish fermented using salt and rice. We first see the word sushi in a Japanese document in 718, so the dish must have come to Japan sometime before that, and the Japanese elites gobbled up that stinky fish meat like it wasn't preserved. It began as a luxury food for the rich. The imperial court even accepted sushi as tribute. I present to your majesty a hundred pieces of gold, two hundred pieces of silver, and a caterpillar roll. One of the most popular dishes was funazushi, and is still being made today. Funa is a type of carp found in streams and lakes. The most authentic funazushi is made from a very picky carp that only lives in Lake Biwa in the middle of Japan. There were a bunch of funazushi recipes back in the day. They all basically went like this. Remove the organs inside the fish and coat it with salt, which sucked up all the water like a million tiny crystal vampires. Then throw the fish into a bucket of cooked rice and go away for a few months or years like a neglectful father. The rice starch broke down into sugars. Bacteria ate the sugars and pooped lactic acid. The acid preserved the fish and gave it a sour taste. Now you had to check it periodically because sometimes you'd open the bucket and find that it turned into a stinky, disgusting, inedible mess. And that's when you knew it was working. 
You can make funazushi in a few months, but sometimes it'll take more than two years to reach peak flavor. There are even precious five-year funazushi for those who are really serious about showing off how much they know about sushi. What does it taste like? Kind of has a cured meat texture like salami. It tastes similar to blue cheese, sharp and tangy. Like if a piece of dry salted meat fell into a puddle of lemon juice and got trampled by someone with athlete's foot. Now, although China had sushi dishes, doesn't exactly mean that sushi came from China. Maybe it came to China from elsewhere. Sushi scholars were on the case. They assumed that sushi was made with fish and rice. They looked at places that had easy access to them, places with rice paddy agriculture, and their gaze landed on Southeast Asia. There were two main theories making the rounds in the sushi professor Facebook groups. That it came from tribes living in the hills of Southeast Asia, or from rice paddy cultures living in Thailand and Laos. They also reckoned that when rice paddy technology came to Japan at around 300 BCE, sushi came along for the ride on little sushi boats. These theories make a lot of sense, so they can't be trusted. There are a few problems. New research shows that rice paddy technology came to Japan much earlier than 300 BCE, like a thousand years earlier. So 300 BCE was probably not when sushi arrived on Japanese shores. But the more important thing was historians assumed that sushi meant fermented fish with rice. But when they looked further, it seems not quite. Did a sushi recipe need rice or even fish? First, the rice question. One old cookbook had a section on osprey sushi. When an osprey ran out of things to eat in the winter, it would catch fish and store them around the water's edge, like it was setting up an Easter fish hunt. It would take a nice, long, satisfying piss on the fish to prevent other birds from eating them. Salt water and the environment naturally fermented the fish and preserved it for the osprey to eat later. The author said he tried osprey sushi once. It was rare and as hard to get as quantum mechanics, so you had to know somebody. The author had a small bite, and he said it tasted like. Unfortunately, he forgot the taste. Convenient. Shockingly, osprey sushi also showed up in a different cookbook, which said that it tasted like sushi made by people. No mention of the pea flavor. Osprey sushi was probably as false as sushi restaurants calling these things wasabi. But the old authors calling it sushi tells us that people thought rice wasn't a must-have ingredient in sushi recipes. In ancient times, rice was a luxury food. Sushi made with rice was for the elites, not the streets. But it was possible that commoners made sushi for themselves using not rice for fermentation, but other grains like millet, wheat, or barley. Now we ain't got no receipts that people did this in ancient times. Commoners didn't write good, but we did find more modern Japanese people in the early 1900s who made sushi with non-rice grains, and the Chinese also used other grains. So it was possible. If it's true that sushi was not considered a rice food, then it might smash those theories about sushi originating from Southeast Asia. Sushi scholars are realizing that they were following the rice when they should have been following the grains. Besides the rice question, there was also the fish question: Did sushi have to include fish or even seafood? The word sushi first appeared in a Japanese set of laws in 718. It mentioned sushi made from abalone and mussels, and something called mixed sushi, probably a mix of different seafoods. In 737, a document recorded a payment of again mixed sushi from a temple to construction workers and lumberjacks. Wooden tags from the 700s labeled things for shipping that included a bunch of different sushi made from different types of fish, but also mussel and abalone. Turns out, different parts of the country specialized in making sushi from different meats. Coastal regions made it from shellfish like abalone, sea squirts, and mussels. Riverlands made sushi from freshwater fish like Crucian carp and sweetfish, and mountainous places made sushi from land animals like deer and boar. So it seemed like early on, sushi wasn't only a rice or a fish dish. Maybe it just meant meat fermented in lactic acid. If so, that's a few more holes in the theories about sushi originating from Southeast Asia. Suppose the Southeast Asia theories are wrong. Then where did sushi actually come from? The answer is, I will tell you right now. It's still a mystery. I'm sorry, but by not viewing early sushi as a fish dish or even a rice dish, it opens more doors for researchers to study where the first sushi dish actually originated. Thank you to Blinkist for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to click on the link below to subscribe. Okay, here's a good question for further study: What happened to sushi after people ate it? 
It needed to come out the other end. How did they do that? Click here for the entire history of Japanese toilets, from outhouses to bidets. We have some new patrons this week. Paris King, you're my king. And Kronos, that's a cool name. Alright, I love you and spread the knowledge.